I think maybe the over-the-top dislike some fans exhibited towards Dark Souls 2 caused the developers to walk back on ideas that were genuinely better. Okay, I, 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 I could spend a good deal of this video defending Dark Souls 2. In fact, I'm going to compile a video looking at the central complaints about it. Um, and why all of them are wrong and lies from criminals, and I'm gonna put that up in a separate video a bit later on. Uh, when that comes up, I'll put the link here. So, okay, cool. Uh, back to Bloodborne. Hello and welcome back to Responding to In Defense of Dark Souls 2. Today we're looking into the story and my god this is one section I do not want to do because a lot of the time people argue for what they felt thanks to the story. Or what the story means to them, which means, generally, that we're heading into subjective town, I suppose. Now, the story in Dark Souls is an interesting topic. People's careers are based almost entirely off how difficult it is to piece together and what happens in this world and why. Dark Souls, as a series, is highly confusing, convoluted, and vague in its delivery. There is no denying it, they do not want you to understand the story without having searched for it, and even then it lacks complete answers. I assume this is all in favour of making players apply their own ideas to the story itself and discuss it with others. Now, my assessment here, and basically all my information is coming directly from playing the games myself and, of course, the wiki, so stay with me. The first game establishes that there was a fog-ridden grey crag of a world filled with arch trees and everlasting dragons. That's pretty easy to understand, I suppose. It'd be nice to know how the dragons survive and what makes them everlasting, but, you know, we can wave that off since it's the base of the universe. This kind of attitude is considered reasonable since we don't know why the Big Bang happened, right? But we enjoy the stories of what happened in detail as a result of our planet. It's not like it's a plot hole. So we can let them have their framing, their base, without details. So we have a world. It's mostly decrepit and filled with dragons. Now suddenly, four people found four Lord Souls and with their power challenged the dragons. Now, despite that sounding really awesome, bonus points for dragons, we have nothing in terms of rules here. The Lords seem to be entities that were simply transformed by the power of the souls that they picked up. But where did these entities even come from? Where, where were they? Were they living with the dragons in peace or as subjects? Did these Lord Souls belong to something that wanted the dragons to be stopped? Why did these characters want to kill the dragons anyway? What, what, why did the souls give them powers? What were these lords doing when they didn't have the lord souls? What species are they anyway, since one is a witch, and one is a blob of skeleton, and the other one's like a large dude, and then the bonus one is a furtive pygmy? What the fuck? Since apparently this was before man's time. The four lord souls that were found were the souls of life, death, light, and dark. Life turned the thingy into the witch, who eventually created demons. Death turned the thingy into Nito, who eventually raised the dead. Light turned Gwyn into Gwyn, eventually ushering in the Age of Fire and ultimately starting the Curse of the Undead. Dark turned the thingy into the furtive pygmy who shattered himself across the ages in hopes that he would one day spawn a Dark Lord who would usher in the Age of Dark. Okay, why do these souls have this effect? Does this work if a dragon were to have picked up the soul? Where did the first flame come from that provided these souls? Did someone set all of this up? Why, why don't the dragons know anything about this since they are confirmed as intelligent beings? How does one start an age of fire. Is it like a bonfire placed in the kiln and then permeates throughout the world and powers up every bonfire? Like, many people say it was done using the power of the soul. What, what is the power of the soul and how do they all know how to wield it to create an age of fire? Which means what exactly? There's there's a lot of flames and stuff? Like, it, it's, it's got nothing to do with the sun, right? It's more to do with the powering and the maintenance of the fires within the world, and the power of the beings within that world. Since apparently the curse of the undead keeps going past the age of fire, and people keep sort of going hollow and the world goes on. But why does the pygmy want an age of darkness? Anyway, there was a war and it finished with the erasure of the vast majority of dragons. During it, one of the dragons who was born without scales betrayed the dragons and allied with Gwyn to bring an end to them. Okay, so there was a big war, and it was won by Team Gwyn. Cool, this began the Age of Fire. 
The Age of Fire involved Gwyn and his company being looked at as gods while living in Anolondo. They ruled over a flourishing Lordran and hunted remaining dragons for sport. However, it was always going to come to an end in the same vein that all fires eventually burn out, so there were attempts to extend the Age of Fire. The Witch of Isolith tried to create a new and powerful first flame to replace the one that's currently fading, and in doing so, created the Flame of Chaos, a flame that spawned demon kind, and while it flourished, so did they. In response, Gwyn's knights battled the demons and failed to defeat them, resulting in the hopes that they could be contained within Isolith forever. As a direct result of the inability to control the flame, it consumed the Witch of Isolith and twisted her and her sisters into horrifying amalgamations. Gwyn attempted to extend the flame himself, and so sacrificed his lord soul and split it with his clan, his children, the four kings, and Seath. This also ushered in the curse of the undead. This is when a creature is branded with the dark sign, and upon death is reformed back to the last fire they rested at. But for every time they do, they lose humanity and their collected souls until they eventually go hollow, and are essentially a distant shadow of their former selves. The world is now filled with small amounts of the living, abominations, and copious amounts of the dead. Filled with stories of heroic and villainous acts, with a strong theme of the cyclical nature of life and death, and how clinging on to what once was is futile because everything eventually fades. The player moves through this land 1,000 years on, and everything is hollowing, decaying, and engulfed in scars of what once was. Everything is lashing out, confused, and clinging on to any sense of life that remains. Through several interactions with the characters of the world, you are set with the task of ending the Age of Fire or prolonging it. Ultimately, this would be the decision at the end of the game, choosing to sustain the hollow world, or bring something new, something potentially better or worse. Do you guys see what I just did? I began, probably to much of my own viewers' disdain, talking about the story while thinking about it in terms of logical plot points and writing consistency within settings rules. Then as I went on and on, I stopped questioning anything and just enjoyed the basic premise and progression of these fantastical creatures committing to actions and receiving consequences for them. At the end of my little speech, I started using emotive language that appeals to your emotional view of the story and it may have made you think about the theme involved on your own personal level, how it may have applied to your own life or the way that you look at life or the game. This story is really cool. It's really interesting. It encourages people to dig deeper and head canon reasoning for why certain events took place and what they mean. This story is also poorly written. Oh god, I'm so sorry, but it's true. Dark Souls is filled with an extreme omission of universal rules and description of motivation of characters and attention to events taking place. There is only a vague through line that you can grasp once you read the entire wiki or watch every video on YouTube, and even then it's filled with admission of lack of explanation from the source material. Though what I am saying is so controversial that I think I'm gonna have to change it. Maybe you guys won't agree that the story is badly written, but will you at least admit that storytelling is bad in this game? As in, the, the method in which the story story is given to us, is extremely inefficient or simply bad. There is a YouTuber who I have both criticized and enjoyed in the past called I Hate Everything, and he was criticized for his critical perspective of Destiny's story. Now, he criticizes Destiny's story because you have to read the story in the grimoire cards online. It essentially means that you have to go online and piece together what actually happened in the universe via the descriptions on all of the different cards. Now, that's not essentially the same as Dark Souls, as all of the items are within the world, but finding all of them and piecing together the names and places is so difficult that you are certainly better off doing it through the wiki. And so, when responding to criticism, I hate everything said this, and I think it's very relevant here. Destiny's good story is in the grimoire cards, dumbass. It's in the grimoire cards. Sorry, I didn't know that. How about you read them, then remake this video? Did you even watch the fucking video? Did you even watch what I said? Did you even watch what I fucking said? You think I should compliment a game's story for requiring me to leave the video game, actively go away from the thing that's supposed to be telling me the story, log into my Bungie account on the fucking website, and go through some cards that you click, and they spin around all nice and animated, and then you can read the lore. Oh, that's really great storytelling. That's really making the most out of fucking video games. Wow, what a brand new medium. Reading cards on the internet, what a fucking great way of telling a story. Good job, Bungie, I take back everything I've said. 
basically it's not good. If you're familiar with my channel then you'll know what I call objectively good or bad is measurable while what can be enjoyable or fun is what I call subjectively good or bad. It's pretty simple. This story is subjectively fantastic or terrible depending on what you get from it on a personal level or investment. Objectively it's a nonsensical mess that ignores several basic writing rules to allow for incredible set pieces to take place. Without sharing an understanding of what things do and what they are, it is impossible to get a meaningful investment from a realistic perspective but what it means to you as a story? Well that might be incredible. Incredible. Let me show you how I look at this. In Game of Thrones, death is final. You don't get to go again. They make this rather morbidly clear in their first season, and when a certain character is brought back from the dead in later seasons, it is made clear that it'll rarely ever happen because of the scenario required. Thus, people of the world will be dying 99% of the time, permanently. This creates a genuine sense of fear and meaningful investment in your characters, knowing that if something should happen to them, it means, as dictated by the universal rules, that you may not see them again. Comparatively, in a show like Super Supernatural, characters are killed in almost every episode. They are often introduced and killed immediately after, yet our main characters brush with death constantly and survive. They are each stabbed and shot, and in one case dragged to hell by hounds in order to be tortured for 30 years, but still come right back in a mere episode. This extends to the point where in season 13, a major character was murdered in the show. The fan's reaction was, ah, he'll be back, he's already died four times. Also, this is true, I checked the Supernatural wiki. This creates an almost sitcom-like investment in the show, where you're enjoying it far less for the substantial content and more for the fun of it, for the ride, if you will the more subjective side of writing. The reason I'm talking about this is that I'm a stickler for universal rules. They really make, you know, a story bind together. In Dark Souls, you really aren't able to grip with the story when you're given all of the information within it because there is no sense of permanence with any of the actions of these people. The ages aren't explained in terms of what they even do or why everyone's afraid of them. People do things that are so removed from any understanding of a rule set that you are simply trying to understand the events that unfold. It reminds me of comparing Breaking Bad to Walking Dead. In one show, several characters are developed and maintained throughout, reacting and learning circumstances until they have to make choices that have realistic results. In a TV show universe, it is most punctured by aggressive and dramatic conversations and actions or deaths. In another show, we get plowed with a myriad of characters that get confusing developments based on being bored and each having an expiry date that results in them dying once they or the writers have decided that they've had their course and suddenly zombies gain powers or the characters temporarily become stupid. This means that you don't understand the world it takes place in or why things change. How do you even begin to have a meaningful investment in something like that? The answer is... Just don't think about it. Or, this stuff isn't important. Or, any story can be torn apart like that. When it comes to objective writing quality, I don't expect any of my viewers to outright agree with my scale, but my scale is predicated on measuring the components and showing why they have an effect on the world and on us. I am of course okay with not knowing why Quelag was corrupted from the waist down alone. I would actually like just to know the idea behind confidently thinking they could create the first flame. I'd like to know more of the character's involvement with it. I'd like to know what they discussed and how it came about, since it spawned the demons of the world and resulted in actions that caused the curse of the undead. Speaking of which, why did the linking of the flame do that? These things are catastrophic, and seeing the characters in the world develop a strong reasoning based on their flaws or strengths while owning their mistakes and growing from them, defining future choices is the potential this story had. Instead, there are a lot of meaningful events that simply happen without substance or development. From what I could tell, people actually cried at that character I referenced dying for the fourth time in Supernatural, as they have cried watching The Walking Dead, I'm sure. And that is literally an undeniable admission that anything can have any effect on anyone. The content can subjectively be valued at any point on a scale, but objectively Objectively, Dark Souls is similar to many stories that lack a consistent set of rules and serve to immerse you in a cool world. Lord of the Rings comes to mind for me as an example of a super cool world with interesting characters that ask you to ignore several moments that create so many questions in terms of writing. Plot holes, big or small, many or few, all have different effects, and once you really think deeply about the ones that are present, you can spot moments in which these things were skipped for lack of effort or talent, or because they wanted fans to think of reasons for it themselves, which, regardless of the reasoning, still results in the same level of quality. Things may be left out because you can't reasonably explain it. Things that are explained sometimes make no bloody sense. This is prevalent throughout the Souls series, and I will understand all of you probably disagreeing with me on this. I really don't see why anybody would agree with me when they love this game. But since this is simply a response series, I'm not going further than to explain myself a little bit. Like, honestly, if I wanted you guys to understand my perspective on story writing, I would literally take a few hours just to go through a lot of different things and try to piece it together for you. But the point of this was groundwork for responding to Harris. My premise is, there aren't a huge amount of truly great stories written to perfection. 
it is far more likely to find standard or bad stories that you can simply connect to and enjoy, and that's absolutely fine. The Souls games have plot hole ridden stories and lore that mostly lacks any sense of rules or consistency that serves as a vehicle for the games and something for fans to speculate on. This is very similar to Five Nights at Freddy's. They cover a myriad of character types and basic themes that I feel have been covered better, yet still evoke a huge amount of emotion in people to the point of them denying suicide. I would never say that doesn't have value, because of course it does, but it could be a hell of a lot better in its quality of writing and its delivery throughout the games. With that being said, let's begin the story section. Dark Souls 1 is, on a technical level, interesting and complex. The opening cinematic explains the setup of the world of the story. Gwyn and co mess up the ancient dragons, build a society using the power of the soul, and people start becoming undead and going mad, and the empire eventually collapses when the flames start to go out and Gwyn fucks up trying to fix it. But what the player actually does is run around a mostly empty world, killing the people who remain so they can open a big door. He opens in saying that the game on a technical level is interesting and complex. I assume this is in relation to the game player, not the story. I'm not sure. He then describes the story in short, and that's fine, but then he says what the player does is run around a mostly empty world, killing the people who remain so they can open a big door. This is very reductive, but it's also entirely applicable to Dark Souls 2, but perhaps he will explain. There isn't much actual interaction with this story. The stuff about everlasting dragons and a war to kill them all doesn't really have much of an impact on the story of the player killing the people who killed them and nicking their souls. What the first game excels at is lore. We have to take this slow because it's such a confusing set of descriptors. First of all, what would it mean to have an interaction with the story of Dark Souls since you kill all of the remaining significant players, choose to push the world forward or maintain it? Of the story that occurs in the game, you have the most important hand in it. Of the story of how Dark Souls came to be, you have no part in it. He says the opening has no effect on the story the player is involved with, but we understand that Dark Souls takes place because of the events in the opening. It is simply the previously on equivalent for a video game, and if that previously is what you wanted the game to be about, well, that's a completely different game, not to mention the fact that if we had an army of dragons to fight as an army of knights, don't you think that just wouldn't play out well with the base mechanics that Dark Souls offers? He says the first game excels at lore, which is basically the story that has passed, the story that enriches the world. I would say that it's just as good as Dark Souls 2 in both regards, but again, let's hear the argument. In the sense that through item descriptions and chance encounters with the people who remain in the world and are safe to talk to, you can learn little tidbits about them as people. You can run into a character, have a brief conversation, and be sure that if you pay attention to the world and objects related to them or their people, you'll learn something about them and their culture. I agree entirely that this is the method in which the Souls games dole out their story, past and present. Environmental storytelling, a method that is indirect. The closest you get to a story is a guy saying, ring some bells. There's an old saying in my family. Fuck your family. This is the reason for the whole mission, like, you meet this guy who's like, you know, my family have this fucked up stupid belief. I don't know what you think a story is, but what you're referring to is motivation for pushing the story forward. I agree that this is something that is very important for any video game with a storyline that wants to be taken seriously, so let's look at your assessment. You meet this guy who has this fucked up belief. Oscar is the man who set you free moments ago. He's the only thing you would have a connection to in this world, since freedom is inherently something everyone wants, and he provided it to you. He describes you as something other than hollow, implying that is what you've seen previously. He then tells you he is dying and is soon to lose his sanity. He asks you to do something for him, potentially as a fair trade for him freeing you, and because both of you share the fate of being undead. He tells you he failed his mission, but that you can potentially keep the torch lit. Thou who art undead art chosen in thine exodus from the undead asylum. Maketh pilgrimage to the land of ancient lords. When thou ringeth the bell of awakening, the fate of thou undead shalt know. He's telling you, as an undead, that you have a fate, and if you want to know what it is, you must ring the bell of awakening. Whether he is lying or crazy is unclear, and he laments that you now know what his task was, and he can die hoping that you'll complete it. After that, he provides you with a key and the Estus, and then waits to die, regrettably admitting that he will be a danger soon enough. As motivation goes, one would be set to go and ring a bell to know more about what the hell is going on, and when you were told that the Age of Fire is ending and you alone have the power to choose whether it will truly end or continue, the investment could be through the roof of player to player. 
Or you could look at it this way. You meet this guy, he's like, you know, my family have this fucked up stupid belief. Now, as I've said previously, it's about the player. The motivation in all three Souls games is the same. You have to kill shit and then take over what you killed was trying to do in the first place. A cyclical tale of life and death, coming and going, rising and falling. I'm okay with Harris having this perspective on Dark Souls 1. I simply hope he is consistent and maintains it for Dark Souls 2. Or another guy saying, ring some bells. Or a serpent saying, hey, Gwyn was cool, kill his friends. Or a different serpent saying, Gwyn wasn't cool at all, he was really rude, kill his friends. The fun of the game comes from figuring out a complete picture of what you can find, but there isn't really a narrative happening for most of it. The player isn't really given a chance to interact with the important events in this world, they're just picking up the pieces of stuff that already happened. As to the first part, you can summarize almost any story that way. For example, Oh, you're gonna go to Drang Lake for some reason. No, oh, there's a king who's done stuff, go kill him. No, oh, I think he lives here, go kill him. No, oh, I guess he's fine. Go kill something else. Now, I've already done a long enough job proving that Harris was extremely biased with Oscar alone, so excuse me for asking that you trust me when I say Harris is removing massive amounts of important details for what these creatures tell you. It isn't a very strong method to share your ideas if you completely ignore the perspective of those who do think this is a valuable motivation. As I said, with Oscar, anyone would be fueled for the whole game in avenging the guy who freed them, or not. Is it well written? Well, not from my perspective, but that doesn't dictate player investment, and that is subjective. And it is the same quality as Dark Souls 2. You said that you don't interact with the important events of the world. You kill what remains of the four great lords and the protectors of Anolondo. You acquire the Lord Vessel, which enables you to choose whether to move the world into a new age, and you don't have the involvement in the important events in the world? In comparison, to me, Dark Souls 2 does something really interesting. You get a cool metaphorical sequence in the opening where a dark sign branded character's family melts away under the weight of the curse making you live so long you forget everything. Already we're given our first proper theme, and it works on both the personal and world level, in that the world is making less and less sense because things are falling away. Which by the way, coincides really well with the fact the world design is like that. He opens with saying that, to him, Dark Souls 2 does something really interesting, which I find strange since it's almost undeniable that all of From Software's creations are incredibly interesting. A whole new set of worlds bringing life to old tales of bravery and war while breathing life into dragons and other fantastical elements. But yeah, that's fine. He describes the opening of Dark Souls 2 as cool while talking about the theme that it clearly represents. Everything fades to obscurity and loss when afflicted with the curse of the undead dead, but this applies aptly to reality. Now, as I said previously, you can gain from the content whatever you will. Harris is clearly already showing his preference for the on-the-nose storytelling versus subtlety, in that the theme of Dark Souls 1 was far more embedded in its depiction of events rather than essentially telling you in the opening cutscene. And you know what? It's fine to have a preference for that, but I loved receiving this theme after thinking about the fate of Gwyn and what the Curse of the Undead meant for our supporting cast, which I felt was delivered with far more finesse. He then says the idea of things falling away is represented in the world design also, and these things mingle together well. The world actually has logical slots for all of the land to come together. It is extremely boring. It is a sense of straight paths originating from the center. Outside of placing lava at the top of the world in one instance, inconsistent weather here and there, and having Aldeas keep cutting through a set of established maps, everything is mostly fine. Just boring. Besides, what is falling away in the opening is time. It is a metaphorical representation of all the years that passed, since we can imagine that the man in the opening had a curse while his wife and child did not. He has outlived them. He has forgotten them. So when he says things are falling apart, it's an actual weak description on purpose to try and make it seem consistent across the world, but it's it's really not. Aldia's keep being placed lazily in the world cannot be looked at as fucking genius. Let's move on. The story itself, to start with, is self-consciously a rehash of the previous game. The Emerald Herald tells you you need to face the king, and to do that you need some big souls. Oh, cool, thanks, nice one. So you do that. Along the way you find areas and bosses strangely evocative of the previous ones. Najka is, shall we say, Quelag adjacent. The gutter is very blight towny, and so on. So, running with the idea that the world is cyclical, then yes, this all follows nicely, and there are a few new places, as well as ideas stemming from the old, which is neatly running in place of the themes that Dark Souls 1 predicated. There's a lot of parallels, but it's never quite made clear that you're explicitly in the same world as Lordran, or at least not the same places. There's just a subtle thing in the back of your head about how this all seems oddly familiar. So you kill all the enemies, and on the way there are these occasional locked doors. There's no explicit sense that you're missing any large areas, or the paths terminate in dead ends or weird shrines with the primal bonfires in them. 
Now he is basically stating facts and I completely agree with him. The world is eerily familiar with many elements that never outwardly present itself as future Lordran, which is neatly tying the theme once again. The game is pretty long just accounting for these four paths. So when you go to Castle Dranglike, you get the sense this really is the end game. You progress all the way through the castle to the shrine beneath and then through the Grave of Saints. There's a real sense of build up. So this is more down to the player, since I really didn't absorb the instructions of the Emerald Herald on my first playthrough personally. When asking friends what their assessment of the story was after beating the game, one of them said, Why did I need to kill a giant to fight the boss, and why did I have to go inside a giant tree? I didn't have an answer at the time because I was early in research for this series, but he looked it up, found a decent enough answer, and moved on. The reason I'm referencing this is that not everyone has the same experience. I didn't even recognize that I was meant to be killing a king, I just wanted to fight bosses and discover lands because the combat and RPG elements of Dark Souls is precisely what I believe the game excels at. It turns out people can have different experiences, I know it's crazy, let's move on. Then you fight Velstad, who's guarding the door to Vendrick. After beating him, you finally go to meet your presumably final opponent, the same final opponents you fought in Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 1, the corrupted king of the world you've been walking through. But instead, this happens. The way he described all of this is accurate, I do not disagree with it, but something that is already clear is that he thinks this is better in terms of delivery compared to the previous games. Vendrick is a shadow of the man talked about in the lore and by the characters that remember him. He, like the fate of the rest of the undead, like the player's character will eventually become, has lost his mind. You don't have to fight Vendrick at all. He's not your enemy. He's just a man who lost his way and everything else with it. Again, we are now reaching into subjective territory as much as I agree with his brief assessment there. The issue is whether people were aware this is the case at all. Personally, I saw this guy and thought, ah, he's hollowed and out of his mind. We can take his stuff and leave him alone, I guess. That sucks for him. It wasn't as impactful for me because I personally wasn't aware of the story, but who cares? I didn't know what I was talking about. Once I did know, it raised a few issues for me, primarily that this was a little on the nose compared to Gwyn. Gwyn was set as a boss for any player who wasn't paying strong attention to the story. Defending the Kiln of the First Flame seemed like it fit with the rest of the game for most people, I suppose, so fighting him would have felt normal. And some players may even have asked why they made him so easy. What they may have missed is that Gwyn, in the ending days of the Age of Fire was only concerned with extending the Age of Fire for himself and his creation, which you are more than able to do for him, so being hostile towards you makes no sense, unless we think back even to Oscar, talking about becoming a threat after losing his sanity. It may open your mind to the possibility that as a thousand years have passed, Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, hollowed. And now, at the kiln, in his confused and frail state, is attacking anything that walks through his door. He lost his mind while remaining near the first flame, hoping to rekindle it after sacrificing his own soul. You read about his power, his massive army, his undeniable majestic creation, and after fighting through what remains of his knights and down a dark and dreary path, you are greeted with a tragic soundtrack to reinforce that this man is nothing compared to the god that came before. You put him out of his misery, and finally make your choice. His remaining power and agency were direct reflections of the curse he himself brought to the world. The curse that forces everything to go screaming into the darkness until they forget everything about themselves and the world surrounding them. Similarly to those stricken with dementia, and that is tragic as a realization about the world of Dark Souls and our very own world. As now, more than ever, history is being hidden away for its offensive nature, enabling us to make the same mistakes. But that was subjective. What I got from the whole thing is for me alone. I think it was cleverly put together to have Gwyn slip under the radar as to what his demise and legacy truly meant. While I still maintain that the story is pretty standard or kind of just bad in terms of quality. Themes have a way of sneaking into someone's analysis and infecting the objective part of the discussion. Dark Souls has so many elements that people connect to while having something incredible in terms of a world and gameplay to embrace that it seems like the story must just be up there with the rest of it. The point is, once again, what you take from these stories is down to the player, and personally, me and Harris connected better with the former and latter games in the series. I am a huge fan of subtlety, and it'll always resonate with me more. Seeing Vendrick so clearly hollowed and walking around is a little bit much for me, but again, everyone can take from the material what they want. It's hard to relate how touching this is. 
The game genuinely feels like it was building to the very final confrontation. The room is built to have a dramatic passage down steps similar to the lead up to Gwyn, and it's built so that the camera naturally passes through it to reveal what Vendrick has become. I feel bad for spoiling it for people who haven't experienced the game yet, but this moment is pivotal to what makes the story interesting. So yeah, this is what I was talking about. You can take from it what you will. As stories generally go, with finding something touching, everyone will be all over the map. Harris personally found it very touching. As for spoilers, I don't know why people would be watching a defense of Dark Souls 2 that is an hour and 20 minutes long without expecting that, but he's right. The whole series is something you should go in with no information about, to be honest. It seriously benefits from the way it teaches you how to play and absorb its content. Though, I find it funny once again that he, he's saying this now, but, you know, just, just a little bit earlier, he's talking about how he has to tell his friends friends, all the different things about how to play these games. You're built up for the traditional Souls game encounter with a fallen king, and instead you're faced with a thing to whom it doesn't even occur to fight you anymore, shambling around almost naked. You just have to pick up the king's ring, which unlocks the final areas and allows you to head to Altia's keep, and eventually meet the ancient dragon who's also not interested in fighting you. He gives you the Ashen Mist Heart, which lets you journey into the memories of giants from the old war Vendrick fought. So he implies that the encounter with Vendrick is unlike the Fallen King encounters in the previous games, which is strange to me since both games retain this sort of encounter, just with different details in execution. He is starting to show his hand. Everything else is just him explaining the following objectives. You get to see a lot of the damage that you encounter in the main path happening. It's really neat. Killing the Giant Lord lets you face Nashandra, Vendrick's queen at the Throne of Want. Killing her nets you precisely one ending. Your character sits on the throne, presumably having become the new king, and then the credits play. You really only see the statue being knocked into place in the memories of the giants. The rest of it is just the same place as before with different filters and enemies that we've seen previously being buffed, topped with an incredibly lackluster boss in terms of mechanical variety. But hey, the rest is true and it is fine to feel that it was great, I suppose, except for the fact that you said it nets you precisely one ending, which I mean, the game has two endings canonically in its definitive edition, but I'm sure he knows that. Though the interesting part is that what he just described so novelly, that's, that's the bit, by the way, that is the the actual bit that Joseph Anderson said is the weakest part of the game. And this is the weakest part of the game as far as I'm concerned. Is that gonna pop up here? Of course not. I mean, it's fine because, you know, maybe, maybe H Bomber guy didn't see Joseph Anderson. No, no, we know that he did. But instead of resetting the game, it just carries on. You're put back in the world. The game deliberately undercuts its story. You win, but what do you win? Kingship over a dying world? The chance to sit in a chair? Only one character in the game even recognizes you as the new king, Shalqua, the seemingly immortal cat who also knows most of the rest of the lore about the other bosses. The reason the game doesn't immediately reset is likely that you don't get forced into New Game Plus. Many players considered that to be frustrating since you may want to explore the world a little more once you rekindle the flame and you could have fallen into losing your character's progression in the world at the time. This assisted the narrative, the idea of a cyclical world, since the moment you complete the story it begins again, as if nothing's changed, except the potential for time passing, cementing the theming of the whole game. In Dark Souls 2, I actually appreciate that they made it more mechanically friendly in terms of sending me to the home base, but it was obstructive to the narrative by having a menu selection reset the world instead of it being natural as a result, because now it implies that your character activates some form of time travel through a bonfire, I suppose. Other than that, Harris talks from his personal experience, describing what being sent to the home world means for him. I don't know why saying the cat recognizing you as a king is even relevant, since the world being truly unchanged would fit his narrative better, and the cat being uncaring about who is the monarch would likely show your effect on the world better, but yeah, you, you gotta justify anything, right? Like anything that gets in your way, you just gotta make it a part of the positives. If you want to, you can use bonfire aesthetics to refight old bosses or refresh enemies if you exhaust them, or you can completely kill all the NPCs, even the Emerald Herald. You can make the world of Dark Souls 2 completely empty of people and monsters. The only way to access New Game Plus is to sit at a bonfire and deliberately choose to start it all over again. I like these choices because they hammer home the hopelessness of the Dark Souls story that was there in one, but undercut by the fact no matter what ending you got, you just started at the beginning again. So then he moves on to talking about bonfire aesthetics, which honestly, as mechanics go, are pretty damn cool in letting you selectively push parts of the game into New Game Plus, and he probably should have spent more time talking about it since they benefit the experience, but this video is not what the title implies. It is solely about proving that Dark Souls 1 isn't as good as Dark Souls 2. He talks about how you can theoretically make Dark Souls 2 empty by exhausting it of its inhabitants, which is more mechanically based in making the runs through the areas easier for players, but narratively, doesn't it make no sense that they don't reappear considering 
wondering how the Curse of the Undead works. And then you get to respawn them if you use an ascetic. How, how, does, how does that match narratively? Like, everything should remain there for the sake of the cyclical nature of the theme itself. Everything rots away until it doesn't even know why it exists, which is what creates the basic enemies. They all have ten lives now, except for the player for some reason. He then says he liked these things because they add to the narrative, which, as I've just pointed out, they don't. They fight the narrative. Following that, he says the game restarting instantly in Dark Souls 1 undercuts the theme, when it is honestly just bloody clear that it's better. The cyclical nature, the beginning following the end, as opposed to you being sent back and then choosing when you want to restart? How, how could that possibly be an undercut? Dark Souls 2 forces you to contemplate how little you've really achieved with all these deaths, and then forces you to decide when it's time to do it all again. Ultimately, Dark Souls 2 is about cycles. The story is deliberately evocative of the previous game, exploring the empire of a king who fell, but with an explicit focus on how this has all happened before, and not just coincidentally. Perhaps it's something we're doomed to keep doing. Humanity, perhaps unable to ever fully escape its own nature, is repeating its mistakes over and over. So now he's talking more specifically about the theming of the game while describing it from a very subjective viewpoint as I did previously. All of this is fine, but he bizarrely refers to the method of delivery as forced, which I couldn't possibly agree with since many of the people I know didn't even know the plot of the first run around the game. The Dark Souls franchise isn't known for being clear the first time around, typically speaking, but I guess he's right that the theme is more ham-fisted here and he considers this a benefit, I suppose. But then he also mentions that the story is dependent on the previous game existing in order to to benefit from the theme. He says there is an explicit focus on this theme in the game, so I guess we'll have to wait for the evidence, but how isn't it a focus in Dark Souls 1 as well? He implies it's all coincidental in Dark Souls 1, which... <sighs> Explain what that means... For a game with so much architecture and character in so many of its designs, the best piece of imagery is the simplest one, the symbol of the dark sign. It's a loop, a circle, reflecting the way the undead return to life no matter what, continuing even after they lose their minds. Humanity itself is trapped in this loop. Normally I would agree that this fully applies to each of the games, but as he just explained, the undead eventually stay dead in Dark Souls 2. It isn't cyclical with its inhabitants. The world has a finished point in which everything is dead until you manually bring them back to life. This flies in the face of the narrative. You are the sole power in the world now. All other bosses defeated and summonable upon your whim. Everything except you can be permanently removed and awaits your decision to resurrect it. This is the reason the cyclical narrative falls apart, but the rising and crumbling of nations is still sort of intact, though I have no idea who's birthing new humans to create these kingdoms. Yet I will still admit that it's more about how you look at it. It's just this weird attitude that Dark Souls 1 was inefficient at presenting the theme when it is simply far more subtle, which may explain why he's either missed it or misunderstood it. The story is much more for the player than in the previous game. It's a story in which the player is expected to contemplate their own actions instead of those of others, and recognize that the problem here isn't the mistakes of the king or his people, but that people as a whole were unable to escape the mistakes that happened in Dark Souls 1. But what's even better is how it makes sure to tell you this isn't just one repeat. No, the story of Dark Souls 1 has happened maybe countless times. So many you don't know and will never fully comprehend it. So he says the story is much more for the player than in the previous games, but I don't see how this is true whatsoever, since you are the person who will usher in the Age of Dark or continue the Age of Fire in Dark Souls 1. The story is entirely for the player to contemplate the cyclical nature of the universe. He says the player is expected to contemplate their own actions instead of those of others. Again, that is in Dark Souls 1, but perhaps you missed it? This is why I appreciate subtlety. His description past that is rather on point once again, but applies to each of the games in the series. Dark Souls 1 alone implies the story of Dark Souls has potentially taken place countless times. In a prison cell in the Lost Bastille is a man made of stone. If you unfreeze him, he refers to himself as Strayed of Olaphis. Olaphis was a kingdom where Dranglike now stands, untold generations ago, so long ago that no one but Strayed and the descriptions of spells and items invented by him or belonging to him even mention it. Wait. This? An NPC telling him about a place that doesn't exist anymore? This is the really significant difference that pushes Dark Souls 2 into the category of better serving the theme? Again, he is right that you can talk to Strayed about this, but I feel like it's really on the nose. The message of the world being stuck in a cycle of rising to power and falling to ruin is better served without a guy blurting it all out. Like, really? What? Why the hell was his statue even here? Who placed him in a doorway to a bonfire in the Lost Bastille? If it was his enemies, why didn't they fucking destroy it? In Dark Souls 1, all the various areas and people and their stories and what happened can be pieced together quite meticulously. You can, with enough work, put together a complete universe out of the facts. In Dark Souls 2, an entire civilization can be so utterly lost that only one man even knows its name. 
Who knows how many empires rose and fell between Olafus and Dranglake, or Lordran and Dranglake, but pieces of them lie scattered everywhere, decayed colossal wrecks, each with their own rise to power and their own mad kings and their own undead curse rending them apart. Okay, he opens with saying that you can understand the majority of the characters and their interactions with the story while appreciating that the world is doomed to repeat itself. You cannot put together a complete universe, several plot points and characters are left out and some are left out on purpose to bind certain parts of the narrative. Then he says Dark Souls 2 shows us that an entire civilization can be so utterly lost that only one man even knows its name, but this was already heavily implied by Dark Souls 1 in that the item descriptions and ramblings from NPCs were all that could breathe life into the structures and monsters of the game. That something as powerful as Gwyn, the Lord of Sunlight, wouldn't even remember his own purpose. You are welcome to prefer the heavy-handed approach, but it cannot be referred to as strictly better. Hell, I think it's strictly worse. The Forest of Fallen Giants is Vendrix doing, but Earthen Peak? The Old Iron Keep? These places rose and fell on their own terms. The DLC, which we'll get to later, each covers its own completely separate tale of a kingdom that rose and fell in roughly the same area. What's compelling about this is that it's more bizarre, more unexplained, and more human. He talks about how there are separate areas within their own stories of rising and falling as there is in Dark Souls 1. He says it's more bizarre, which, yes, it is bizarre that we have three kingdoms to teleport to, thus not having a grounded geography that are ice, fire, and poison themed, but hey, lazy. He says it's more compelling, which is totally subjective, but he says it's because it's unexplained, which mostly falls with the whole series, but there is more confusion to be had with Dark Souls 2 and its universal rules, I'll give you that. Though I really don't see how it makes the game more compelling. Then he says it's more human. How and why is something that is bizarre and unexplained tantamount to being human? Is he saying that it is more relatable? You know, you fucking know that that is down to the person. There's no objective way to say what is more relatable for a human. People in the Souls universe are victims of a history they might never be able to learn. The story is about being lost in a confusing maze you can never fully understand, a feeling strengthened by the nightmarishness of the actual physical world. Okay, again, the lesson that people are victims of a world they are doomed to repeat is within Dark Souls 1, and it is far more subtle. And once again, the world isn't nightmarish. Like I said, it's mainly Aldia's Keep and the Iron Keep. The rest of it fits fine, it's just boring and simple. That's, that's, that's all. Quaylag alone was simply a sad story about a woman transformed into a demon by an attempt to create more life. But now she's contextualized as a victim of a far deeper problem that mankind is having trouble escaping. Because no matter what, it seems to keep happening over and over. I don't know how many times you're going to repeat this, but it forces me to do it as well. The theme was well covered in the first game, and once again, they weren't as ham-fisted as to bring in a Quelag clone to the story to imply repetition of a cyclical nature. The story of Dark Souls 1 did this without pounding the concept into the ground. Something really cool and kind of subtle is hidden in the basement of Majula. Down, hidden in the dirt, so small not many people notice, is a small fractured piece of the Lord Vessel from the first game. This is the best expression of what Dark Souls 2 is doing with its story. It's interested in telling a story about being unable to fully piece together what's happening as the character loses their minds in a doomed world of destroyed statues. Again, true, this theme is also in the first game, so if all we are now talking about is whether Dark Souls 2 does the theme well, then sure, I would say it's absolutely fine, but I know that I'll have to defend Dark Souls even more soon enough. Your character doesn't even know what a Lord Vessel is. To them, this is nothing, just a thing lying in the dust. It also represents the developers' attempts to do their own thing and move on by reducing an icon iconic part of the previous game to a piece of rubble in a basement. How is telling the same story but making the lesson far more obvious doing your own thing? And why have we only been talking about one theme this whole time? There's so much more to explore in these stories and you've made the same point six times. For me, the weakest parts of the previous games is when I got handed a whole heap of names, roles, and backstory. Demon Souls did this too by just listing a bunch of people who went into the fog. I could just find those people and learn about them manually, but instead the first game's open with a needless roll call and a story about a fight with dragons that doesn't really tell me anything. The guys I'm going to kill killed a bunch of dragons a long time ago, and that's important because... I'm sorry that having names and places in your world makes it harder for you to enjoy and embrace it, but I personally prefer more of that substance. I like something to cling on to, a world to build. 
He says the first games open with a needless roll call, but they are describing the basis for the story. It was pushed forward by characters in a world. This has so much more to get invested in, so many players and rules already established, as opposed to, you're a guy, you don't want to be a zombie. Go kill a thing. As you can see, I can summarize a game just like he can, and it's incredibly frustrating when you hear any analyst do this. But when you really think about it, the opening cinematic in Dark Souls 2 is explaining in detail the subtle message in Dark Souls 1. With Dark Souls 1, they told a fantasy story with many interesting characters and elements that housed a troubling and introspective theme. Dark Souls 2 ran headlong with the theme and added, what? A, a guy who knew about an old kingdom, a hollowed king that was a blatant reference to the curse of the undead, and two pieces of the landscape that were for some reason incompetently placed down. Is there something I've missed here? However, the reason I just spoke as I did for the past two paragraphs was to illustrate a point. It really comes down to personal preference, which he seems to simply avoid saying as much as possible in this section. Which one you prefer and how good you think they are is down to your standards and perspective. Proving things with this takes a hell of a lot longer than Harris or I will be giving it right now. Again, if he was making an actual defense of Dark Souls 2, then he would simply be talking about Dark Souls 2's themes and plots and characters, but he has to just keep telling us that it's better than Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls, which as you can imagine can be very off-putting for the average viewer, if there's any left by this point. One flaw in the themes of Dark Souls 1 was for all its criticisms of the world Gwyn had built, an awful lot of time was dedicated to his kingdom to exploring its majesty, and even when you darken an Orlando, you still find yourself compelled to look upon his works and despair. Dark Souls 2 does the most compelling and interesting thing it could possibly do with the story of Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, Master of Anor Londo, King of Lordran. It asks, who? I don't even think he's mentioned by name at all. What do you mean that for all the criticisms of the world Gwyn had built? Gwyn did a pretty good job by most accounts before the fall, and Anolondo is the equivalent of the heavens. Of course it looks incredible in the day or night. What is more compelling, the fact that somehow everything from the previous game was erased without any form of recording or events surviving the ages, or that Gwyn himself has forgotten who he was? Again, subjective. Gwyn may well have been a good and mighty king. But the lone and level sands stretch far away, and he is gone. The paranoid king who had strayed petrified is gone. The king of Lordran is gone, and the king of Dranglake is gone. But his burnt-out husk still walks the earth yet, and we remember him for now. Again, you are absolutely on point with the analysis for the seventh time. But which you prefer is down to the person, I'm afraid. Which is objectively better? Well, the writing is similar in both. I would say they are both on par, but I prefer subtlety personally, and I think an argument could be made for less is more here. I think a lot of people wanted a story with the exact type of intricacies of the previous game. I can see wanting that and understand being disappointed, but I prefer the lonesomeness and the unsolvable puzzle you're given of a world where the weight of time has dissolved away most of history and even the physical world twists into itself in impossible ways and icy peaks can give way to the flames of chaos. It's maddening and majestic at the same time in a way that no concretely designed physical world can ever be. So we are now delving into the hyper-subjective, nothing he just said is supported by any evidence at all. Firstly, the lack of intricacies was not the problem I, or many others, felt with the issues with the story. Personally, for the eighth time, it was just too blatant with the message and the story of a man seeking to prevent his own hollowing coming to the realization that he can't, wasn't as interesting to me as being swept up in a world that had you complete some tasks, kill some monsters and finally have you come to the realization of what was happening under the skin thanks to the very curse you are afflicted with. Secondly, you say you prefer the lonesomeness, which, I mean, how are you more lonesome in Dark Souls 2. The multiplayer is super fucking easy to set up, which is a boon mechanically, but narratively, not so much. Not that I'm defending Dark Souls 1 here, that game needs a serious patch for multiplayer. Needs a patch for a lot of stuff. Thirdly, you try and link the theme to the physical world again, but as I will continue to state, it is two major examples and that's it. One being that lava is built at the top, which is clearly a design oversight, since placing a sea of lava at the top of a windmill while maintaining the structure of everything coming together just fine is hilarious. The other being the placement of Aldia's keep in and among several other models when looking at the world coming together, which again, likely because they had already made shaded woods and forgot where they planned to put the endgame sections, is incompetence. These things are not evidence of time ripping apart the world, which by the way, even if the problems with Aldia's keep and the iron keep were present throughout the world, I would still say that your perspective is subjective until you get a developer to say that it was done on purpose, because even if it was, it's fucking stupid. I mean, it's just like that fucking meme about the guy who convinces everybody he's retarded. Then you say that I 
icy peaks give way to the flames of chaos, which is a little inaccurate. You jump down a big hole in the icy kingdom into a fiery pit. It's another one of those don't question how all of this comes together moments. But still, not too far from what would realistically be possible in a world of magic. And finally you have this line. It's maddening and majestic at the same time in a way that no concretely designed physical world can ever be. This statement translates to me as... It does not make sense, and a world that does make sense would not be able to not make sense. You've peppered in emotive language, but that's all you really said. Overall, this bit is inaccurate and filled with emotive language to make the theming of Dark Souls 2 seem like it has more going for it, when in reality it is a rehash of the first game without the subtlety, as I have had to keep repeating. This is imagery. This is visual metaphor. There's doubtless plenty of theory crafting in Souls lore circles about who the woman with the spinning wheel is, when you're told everything you need to know in just how she's presented here. She's deliberately evocative of the fortune-telling spirits with spinning wheels that exist seemingly throughout human mythology and folklore. Okay, I'm sorry, now we've changed gears and we're talking about what this one woman might represent. I don't understand the relevance here, but continue. More specifically, this character appears to be a reference to one of the most popular portrayals of this type of character in film history, the one that appears in Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood, also known as Spiderweb Castle. Throne of Blood is an adaptation of Macbeth. In case you haven't heard of Macbeth, Macbeth's about a happy-go-lucky guy whose destiny is to become king. But it turns out being the king isn't all it's cracked up to be. Interestingly enough, right before the character who's a reference to Spiderweb Castle, just to make sure you know they get it, they've just put a spider right there. The appearance of a character seemingly straight out of this film, a film about the darkness befalling people whose destiny is to rule, is a better piece of storytelling than all the item descriptions and all the loot drops in the world. Okay, so assuming this is a reference, what does this add to the story in Dark Souls 2? And this one particular reference is taking subtlety a bit too far, wouldn't you say? Since barely anyone is going to make this connection, meaning that what it provides as a reference is going to be missed, whether or not it's meaningful. Putting a spider in there could literally just be putting a spider in there. How do you know all of this is true? How do you know the spinner isn't a reference to Disney and its empire with its downfall being inevitable? Secondly, saying that Macbeth is about darkness befalling people whose destiny it is to rule is such a shoehorning of trying to connect Dark Souls and Macbeth, it's unreal. Macbeth is more about the selfish acts of a ruler to remain in power, becoming tyrannical and dying as a result, while Dark Souls is more about clinging to the world you know and love, but realizing that it all fades eventually, as does everything. Obviously, on a broad term, I guess you could connect the stories, but more detailed examinations would show that they are very different stories that share some similarities, as does Dark Souls and Game of Thrones, or Dark Souls and the History of Rome, or Dark Souls and the War of the Roses. Let's not force this, please. You then say that this alone is a better piece of storytelling than any item description or loot drop in the world. I don't know if you're aware of the idea that a reference to another story doesn't tell your own story, but this statement is ludicrous. Many people don't even recognize the reference, and after you've explained it, some don't even see the relevance of it anyway. But because it relies on understanding of imagery outside of video games and visual storytelling, none of this information can be found on any wiki about the story of the Soul series. In a way, the story of Dark Souls 2 is the ultimate in nerd horror. It tells a story of a universe it's impossible to build a comprehensive fucking wiki about, and to nerds, that's the scariest thing there is. Nope. The actual reason it isn't on the wiki is because it can't be confirmed. The wikis operate on tangible information. There is speculation on the wiki here and there, but they always have a reference from the game itself. A spinning wheel and a spider isn't really enough, and I think I agree with those who created and maintained the wiki. This one is a bit of a stretch and doesn't offer enough substance even if true. The whole line about how it's impossible to build a wiki about Dark Souls 2 is hilarious because it's nonsensical. There is a comprehensive wiki about it, and it's full of information, but that doesn't change the holes that are in the story being told within the games. Please maintain a form of reality. This opening proceeds into a series of destroyed castles, ruined thrones, mad, dead kings. When you finally get your own throne, there's a worrying ambivalence to it. The best Dark Souls 1 could muster was having sad music play over the last boss, and if you look at Jimmy's pants, it tells you how bad he was when he was a kid. Dark Souls 2 puts you into the role of the last boss, becoming patriarch of a world on its way to its doom, ultimately failing to achieve anything. And it asks you how you feel about that, and where you go from here. 
The opening is a bunch of ruins. Whatever you read into with this is, is down to you. And more importantly, if you are genuinely summarizing one of the most heartfelt and meaningful moments in the Dark Souls series like that, then I don't think you understood the game. I've only done it to Dark Souls 2 to prove that you can do it to anything, but if you keep summarizing the game like it's meaningless while inventing your own meaning for Dark Souls 2, then surely it's only a matter of time before you realize how much of a hypocrite you're actually being. You end this mini-section by saying that Dark Souls 2 puts you in the role of the last boss, becoming patriarch of a world on its way to its doom, ultimately failing to achieve anything, and it asks how you feel about that. The fact that you think Dark Souls 1 didn't do this, again, tells me you didn't understand understand the subtlety of the storytelling in the game, and that's a huge shame. You took Gwyn's place, you performed the very mistake he did, or you threw it all away and embraced the Age of Dark. Just watch Vati Vidya for Christ's sake, Harris. Pacing of Dark Souls 1 wasn't great after the Lord Vessel, but it did a lot more with a lot less when it came to its plot. Its introductory video set up the world and the major players very efficiently. Efficient storytelling is being placed over good storytelling, or even a good story. I think gamers on the whole are still kind of enamoured with a Wikipedia style approach to storytelling where everything can be concretely pieced together in an objective narrative when really I think there's a lot of other ways you can explore a story. Why does a story have to be efficient or good? Why can't it be both? On top of that, it isn't gamers who like things to make sense, it's humans. What you clearly don't understand, Harris, is that you like the story because it makes sense to you. The absolute myriad of issues sends you a message of incompleteness with the title, this is incomplete and that's what makes it complete, which makes sense to you. The rest of us are simply confused and frustrated by it being incomplete. Saying that there are other ways to explore a story and only having said that the theme is repeated and an old lady is a reference to an old film about a king is hardly representative of opening your mind since we could all sit for days pointing at splats of mud on the floor and saying they reference anything we want. Concrete storytelling always wins because we know what the message was and we can appreciate the construction, the time, the effort, the talent, all of that behind it. When the story is scrambled with pieces missing and the justification is, it's better this way, you should probably realize why it is you have to argue that to so many people, rather than that being the way that all of the greatest stories are told. The intro video to Dark Souls 2 shows the main character dropping into some kind of whirlpool, because the old lady tells us we're cursed, and the only hope of a cure is to go to Drang Lake for some reason. She actually says we'll have no idea why we're going to do any of the stuff we're about to do. Okay, so this is why he went so crazy into the old lady bit that we were talking about. You know, it was really weird that he picked that alone in the entire game to talk about some crazy reference that none of us saw. It's because Matthew Matosis just called her an old lady instead of appreciating the fact that, you know, it's, there's some huge story behind it. I mean, hell, we gotta get some more criticisms into Matthew Matosis, don't we? So let's tackle what he said. Matthew Matosis is spot on. The opening tells us that we have the curse of the undead and we will lose everything eventually without remembering it and we won't even care. With a family shown to give us an idea of what she's talking about. Then she says we're going to turn up at the gate of Drang Lake Castle and not know why. Then we plummet into a whirlpool. What is this whirlpool? Why are there skulls and smoke coming out of it? Who is she? Is she hollow too? Do we trust her? Why is Drang Lake where we are going? Why hasn't our character heard of Drang Lake? Who, what the what the hell's going on? You're left with nothing but to assume this is all metaphor and there is no vehicle this time, nothing to grasp. This world is literally just saying, go. This visual metaphor for falling into darkness, you know, the thing that going hollow does to your mind, is reduced to falling into some kind of whirlpool. That is some kind of whirlpool, which is literally what it is. What it is figuratively is anyone's fucking guess, since that shit is subjective. A woman visually coded as having the power to see the future, predicting a horrible fate in which we do things without fully understanding their purpose because we lose our minds, is reduced to the old lady telling us to go to Drang Lake for some reason. She is literally an old lady. She says we end up in Drang Lake, but we won't know why. Figuratively, she can reference whatever the hell you want from 1950s, Harris. What do you- what do you even mean by visually coded? Did you really just say that instead of reference? No wonder this critical approach to storytelling resulted in finding the story lacking. No, this is just an old lady telling us to do things for some reason. There's no nuance or meaning or cinematic language being utilized here. That level of understanding has no place in my nuanced critique of a video game. You've literally done that with Dark Souls 1 throughout your video, reducing moments of heartfelt triumph and sorrow to nothing. The closest you get to a story is a guy saying ring some bells, run around a mostly empty world killing the people who remain so they can open a big door. The guys I'm going to kill killed a bunch of dragons a long time ago and 
that's important. Gwyn wasn't cool at all, he was really rude to kill his friends, having sad music play over the last boss, and if you look at Jimmy's pants, it tells you how bad he was when he was a kid. How is this any different from your approach? Whether Matthew wanted to include every figurative meaning for that opening in his video is up to him, but he chose to stick to what was objective. It turns out if you listen to the old lady before you jump into the fucking whirlpool, she says a bunch of shit that doesn't make any sense. However, if we simply go with figuratively falling down a spiral of decay after talking to some elder wise person, you, it's, it's, it's all on the nose. If you look at this as character dialogue, however, it doesn't make sense. Besides that, are you going to comment on the slew of criticisms that Matthew brought up about the intro aside from the old lady in the whirlpool? I mean, fucking hell, he's made like a hundred points in his video and you've responded to what, three? And your goal was to, what was it again? Destroy the video? It is necessary that this critique be defeated and destroyed at all costs. He even makes several criticisms about the inherent effect it has on being an RPG to establish your character before you've even chosen to customize them and create your own history. The tone of the intro is completely out of phase with the game itself, setting you up for some heavy, mentally scarring realizations, but then comically talking about losing your souls and how that's going to be so frustrating. Speaking of which, the memes of dying in this game crop up all over the introduction and it's extremely off-putting in terms of immersion. But what about the fact that it shafts female players from even having a say about their character's orientation in the opening? This is something a staunch feminist such as yourself would likely have a huge problem with if you weren't heavily concerned with defending the game regardless of its flaws. I actually think you chose to ignore these issues because they're undefendable, but as we draw closer to the end of your video, there's going to be a hell of a lot more of those arguments coming from me. New Game Plus is the bad ending. You press a button and admit that all that's left is for everything to happen again. There's another ending, which came out when all the DLCs had come out and also adds a new character. I think this aspect of the story is interesting in its own way, but I don't like how people use it as an excuse to criticise Dark Souls 2, pretending there wasn't enough story in the initial release and this is an admission of that and they're finally fixing it, or they're patching the story in in post or something. New Game Plus is the bad ending? As we've established, it just resets the game, which is inevitable, just like the first game. You say it's about admitting there's nothing left to do but for everything to happen again, which, if this is a video game, it's the only thing that can ever happen. As to them patching the story in, they literally patched in another ending to the game, allowing the player to choose, which is something they took away. The developers have now changed the story from the game from what it originally was. They've patched in new content that finished the story the way they wanted. Remember, Director's Cut Definitive Edition. So they clearly thought the story was lacking or they would not have done that. It is very simple and obvious that having the choice to walk away was important to players and so they edited this story to have that be an option. Aldia was already established, he simply wasn't created yet. They needed more time, but they had to stick to a schedule, or they wanted to split a part of the game off and sell it, but who's judging? I know you don't like it when people criticize the game in any way, Harris, but this is one of the myriad of problems the game faces in each of its major and minor aspects. You can't just say you don't like that people are criticizing it. There's plenty of story, but just not the kind everyone wanted. For me, it was already complete in its incompleteness. But giving the player the option of getting an ending where they beat another boss and walk out is a nice little bonus. It's a nice extra little thing to give people, and that's alright. So there we have it, that's the end of the story section, and he literally finished it off with saying that the story not being complete was how it was complete, and people who didn't like it were simply unable to appreciate that kind of story. There is a strong trend throughout this video that I'm sure everyone has noticed by now, that is, if you point to things that are out of place and nonsensical in an otherwise consistent and grounded project, and tell your audience that those things are not negatives but positives that add to the entire title itself, it comes across as a little bit weird. When someone creates a scale talking about how they justify and identify things that are well made and constructed with so much detail and purpose, Purpose, they eventually have to accept things that sit strictly on the bad parts of the scale by its own rules. I enjoy the heck out of Batman Forever and Batman and Robin for how goofy the whole thing is, but they are terribly made films in many aspects. You are not going to catch me making nonsensical arguments in a video titled In Defense of Joel Schumacher. You can talk about why you enjoy them, you can talk about why you think the objective criticisms aren't that bad in retrospect, but what you can't do is take those objective issues and use the rules of things not making sense to justify them as great design choices. Hell, I have to explain this every single video in case anyone forgets and thinks of me as some asshole, which I am. But there is a difference between subjective and objective, conflating them makes everything so much more difficult to understand. His closing argument in response to the idea that the DLC is tacked on is that it's a nice little extra thing to give people and that's alright. Not sure how to respond to that, considering whenever he describes something as nice or cool or neat. As far as I'm concerned, he's already insulted it more than I could. But I think it is telling that he's trying to describe something that everyone thinks is terrible and the best he can do is say the content is nice. Regardless, that about does it for the story section and another round of shitting on Matthew Matosis for good measure. I hope you've all been enjoying this. We are now faced with about two parts remaining. Thank you ever so much for watching, folks, and I will see you next time.
That was interesting. Calm. Don't get angry. It was already complete in its incompleteness. 